Uh, good morning, welcome to CSIS. Um, I clearly underestimated turnout, so we will be bringing more chairs. I thought, you know, four day weekend, rain, uh, but there will be more chairs coming in soon. Um, we're going to have a, a good discussion today. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Donna Edwards is the representative for Maryland's fourth congressional district, just on the road from us, and she's been in office since 2008. Uh, she serves on the science space technology committee and is the ranking member for the subcommittee on space um, before going to law school and entering politics uh, congresswoman edwards worked for lockheed at the goddard space center on the space lab program all those who know what space lab is hold up your hand oh this is a good audience we were laughing about it beforehand is it's like <laughs> so someone with real background in the in the industry and on the issue um, she's going to talk about the importance of federal investment in civilian space, the role of NASA in economic growth, the benefits to the U.S. of maintaining a robust uh, space program, uh, something which I'm pretty sure most of you believe in, and how we need sort of a unifying vision for NASA's, NASA's role and for space exploration. And I understand that today you'll be introducing legislation on this. Could be. Um, we'll find out. So <laughs> with that, um, the format for today is the congresswoman will speak for 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how you want, uh, and then we'll take questions for a little bit of time. So with that, let me turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, and good morning to everyone. I want to especially thank the Center for Strategic and International Studies this morning uh, for allowing me to join you uh, to discuss the future of the nation's civil space program. And, um, you know, I've always relied, and this is not brown nosing, although you do learn how to do that in school. I have relied tremendously on the good work of the folks here at CSIS. And so I just really appreciate being able to be here today. And as I, you know, look out, I see a lot of friends and colleagues, people who work in the industry, the staff of the science committee, I can see them um, as well. Um, and I know that they're waiting too to hear what I want to say this morning. Uh, and so I'll get on with it. Like some of you, and as Jim just described, I'm a Mercury, Gemini, Saturn, uh, not wondering but knowing that we could indeed journey beyond the Earth and into the heavens. I watched the miracle of those early missions on my little black and white television, our family television, and I watched in amazement that first step, that giant leap. And so I've been hooked since childhood, and I think the question for all of us is how we hook this next generation uh, from kindergarten forward. And so while the fo focus of today's discussion is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's human spaceflight efforts, NASA is and should remain a multi-mission agency. And I want to reaffirm my commitment today to that approach. Indeed, it's the connectedness of the multi-mission concept that makes NASA and the United States the envy of the world. In addition to human exploration and spaceflight, NASA has made incredible progress in meeting national priorities to improve observations of our dynamic Earth and its processes, to explore bodies within our solar system, to advance heliophysics and research astrophysics, to understand the creation and the properties of our universe. In fact, NASA has such unique expertise in each one of these fields that its missions are linked to its stated vision of reaching new heights and revealing the unknowns to benefit all humankind. Those aren't my words, those are from NASA's own website. It's its mission. We have to work to ensure that NASA's diverse portfolio is balanced and that it's funded adequately to reflect our commitment to each of these components. If we expect NASA to do the work of the future, we have to provide a budget in the present that allows those goals to be filled. It is perhaps my biggest nitpick uh, with the way that Congress does business. And I might add, to do that work within achievable timelines and with safety at the forefront. As an authorizer and a member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, I remain committed to outlining the missions of the agency and to be honest about what it takes to get the job done. We're a nation of great people, we've said that. We've done amazing things, we have. Um, but it's time for us to support NASA and our space industry in doing those amazing things in the 21st century. Since its inception in 1958, NASA's been the anchor of our nation's civil space program. 
and from Dwight Eisenhower's pen to President Kennedy's call to action in 1961, NASA has led the charge to expand the boundaries of our scientific and technological capacity while it's meeting daring challenges of national significance. NASA's success in civil space has inspired generations of scientists, engineers, and astronauts, and just plain interested people like me. Uh, NASA's young and old continue to be captivated and motivated by the mission. And indeed, the most recent solicitation for astronauts, even without a defined new destination, resulted in an astounding 6,400 applicants, nearly double the number during the space shuttle era. Thankfully, enthusiasm in the public for civil space and human exploration remains robust. We have to make sure that that's true in the government realm as well, among politicians. And so therein lies the test to define the next generation of science, innovation, and exploration to match that enthusiasm. Now, from the beginning, NASA was given a daunting task, create a civil space program in the nation largely from scratch. Uh, which has led to the growth of a global civil space enterprise valued at nearly $300 billion, but while also meeting one of humankind's greatest challenges, name, namely uh, landing a man on the moon. Uh, now, during the, this year's State of the Union address, President Obama called for a level of research and development that's not been seen in 50 years since the early days of the space race. And while he didn't mention NASA specifically, we know that space exploration has to be the centerpiece of an innovative innovation agenda that President Obama described. I think it's time for us to be unified as a nation around a bold vision for NASA, the industry she inspired and for our entire nation. Now in 1957, uh, when the Soviets launched their Sputnik satellite, we had no idea how we would beat them in space we just knew that we could. And we set in motion the path to the moon and ushered in several decades of innovation that have made the United States the premier leader in science, engineering, and space exploration. Now similarly, our nation's 21st century space innovation agenda requires the same high risk, high reward wager. We can't simply shelve the past and move into the future. But our 21st century space innovation agenda, and get used to hearing that, because I believe it is a 21st century space innovation agenda, should reflect the times that have changed in those 50 years. So unlike the 60s, we have now a mature agency at the helm where tough lessons have been learned about schedules and budget and safety. We have a mature industry that's entrepreneurial and nimble. It's ready to take on tasks that are assigned and also prepared to create their own. We have a mature international set of partners who are prepared to collaborate as they never have before. The International Space Station was really just a dress rehearsal for the future challenges. And bar none, we have the best scientists, the best engineers, and the best workforce to meet those challenges. One thing that is the same as yesterday is that the United States must lead. One of NASA's most recent undertakings, the Curiosity rover, captivated thousands who stood in Times Square and thousands more around the country. I'm smiling because I was one of them. Uh, up at night to watch what some have described as a scientific and technological marvel. I just thought it was cool and it was a lot more precise than my own parallel parking. Not only did NASA demonstrate that she's still on the cutting edge of scientific research and engineering, it was also really good economics. According to the agency, Curiosity helped create and support 7,000 good, high-paying American jobs during its eight years of planning and development. And most of those were in the private sector. So when we think about how we grow our economy, and how we create a highly skilled workforce, we have to remember that NASA has always been, will always be, a source of innovation and tangible economic benefits for American families. The fact is that from the beginning, NASA, and by extension, the entire space industry has always been good business. Maryland is home to 17 of the top 25 aerospace companies, but we're not alone. From startups to large corporations, big and small universities, the United States is really fertile ground for space entrepreneurs. 
During the early years, technology innovation and development proceeded at a rapid pace to meet those challenges, from rocketry to aeronautics to commercialization of lunar mission technologies. The result has magnified the influence of, the sp of space exploration. Now, one of my favorite publications is NASA's journal Spinoff. I love knowing about the things that we take for granted every day that come from technology development that was spawned by space exploration over the last 50 years. Water purification technology used on the Apollo spacecraft is now employed in several applications to kill bacteria, viruses, algae and community water supply systems, and yep, my own home water filter. Computer-based advances made possible integrated inventory and process management systems, improved computer-assisted manufacturing. In fact, this morning, as I was getting dressed on television, there was a company that was running an ad about its improved manufacturing processes that were all electronic and digitized and computerized. That's because of NASA technology. Nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, we hardly even say that anymore, MRIs, computer tomography CTs and microelectronics that are used to regulate heart pumps, lasers for satellite-based atmospheric research used for my eye laser surgery, and cool suits by astronauts on the moonwalk that are used for individuals with multiple sclerosis have really transformed medical technology. And the list goes on and on. Um, I think uh, sometimes I go to schools and I describe to students my connection, personal connection to NASA technology, and I describe the car accident uh, that I had, where that airbag that saved my life was NASA technology. And we can't even find a car that's manufactured today that doesn't have that technology in place. And so when we commit ourselves to ambitious goals, we should do so with the knowledge and the total confidence that we have a workforce that's capable of truly awe-inspiring results. And today, that competent workforce is waiting for a bold vision for NASA's future that's going to take us to the next frontier. Now, Curiosity has 1.4 million Twitter followers. I'm one. I know that there are a lot in this room. But in 1997, the landing of Sojourner, a smaller NASA robot, streamed live on the internet to audiences of hundreds of thousands. Later, Spirit and Opportunity also had their turn on the internet when they landed on Mars. So one can only imagine what will happen when we send people there. There's a growing consensus among the scientific community that that next great frontier really is Mars, and I agree. This is our moment to unite behind a truly audacious vision. It's time to meet the American public where it already is, and the American public is already on Mars. With Sojourner, with spirit, with opportunity and curiosity, it's time for us to recapture our frontier spirit with NASA once again, guiding us to do the absolutely impossible. So we have a choice. We can either hold on to and reminisce about past missions and accomplishments, or we can chart a bold new vision for 21st century space exploration and innovation. I want to choose the latter. We don't need another report or another commission. It's time now that we commit, I mean really commit, to a manned Mars mission. This will require collective and uniform support on the part of the President, Congress, NASA, and its workforce the private sector, and the scientific community, all of us on one page and of one mind. In fact, I think that part of what has happened over these last couple of decades is that even at the height um, of employment, 135,000 or so folks, and now down to around 50,000, if I have my numbers right, part of that, in part, is because a lack of vision and clarity on the part of policymakers, and that truly has to change in order for the agency and the industry to succeed. We have a space agency that's demonstrated that it can operate in fast forward and make Mars happen. We just need to give it the tools and the resources that it needs to succeed. Investments in our civil space enterprise support emerging industries, foster commercialization, and grow our economy while improving our international competitiveness. However, lacking an ambitious and unifying vision, coupled with flat or decreased funding, our long-successful, mission-focused human spaceflight program 
has been paralyzed and imperiled by starts, stops, and redirection. Without a unifying vision that inspires scientists and engineers, contractors, researchers, and the American public, that inspires kindergartners, we risk losing our global edge in space and jeopardize significant advancements in innovation and economic development. Failure to establish a visionary goal undermines our ability to attract, recruit, and maintain the skill sets that are necessary for high technology projects. Our current experienced workforce continues to age, present company excluded, and is in, is in jeopardy of switching industries because uncertain long-term missions and funding result in declining morale and increase the potential for risk. The reality is that we simply cannot afford to have our best and brightest leave the space workforce. If our preeminence diminishes, so too will our workforce. The risk of diminishing stature in space exploration cannot be overstated. And while the United States remains a leader, there are increasingly more spacefaring nations. These countries are not just planning to put satellites into orbit, but they're planning ambitious exploration missions that include the moon, near-Earth asteroids, and even a mission to Mars. The Chinese are taking serious steps to build their space program and recently completed their fifth manned mission and have goals to complete a sample return Mars mission by 2030. And our current dependence on the Russians to access the International Space Station is another area of consternation that has to be fixed. And while these nations and others will experience varying degrees of success, it should not be our goal to engage in a competitive race. But if competition is ne necessary for us to gun the engines, then we have to do that. Our goal has to be to capitalize on our current expertise and the spirit of exploration that's helped us succeed over the last century. The truth is that space exploration is truly difficult. Missions can take unexpected turns and unforeseen challenges are certain to arise. Now my colleagues on the House Science Committee also have to be challenged to appreciate the complex scientific missions and the fact that no one, not anyone, can plan for the unknown. Put simply, in space, things just happen. NASA and its talented private sector partners, of which there are many, has been all, always been capable of meeting any challenges presented. And with over 100 successfully launched manned flights, in addition to its other mission directorate activities like developing the Hubble Space Telescope, spacecraft to study Jupiter and Saturn and explore outer space, and Earth observing satellites that have revolutionized our understanding of our processes. The agency has a success rate that far exceeds other spacefaring nations. We're good at this. And with respect to Mars activities, NASA has completed 13 successful missions out of 19 attempts. Comparatively, the Russians have four partial successes and 15 failed missions. Curiosity became the sixth rover to attempt to land on Mars and is NASA's fourth rover that's been sent there. Again, we are good at this. In recent years, our unmanned space program has also been tackling new challenges. For one, the rover became, the Curiosity rover became NASA's most advanced spacecraft equipped to navigate the difficult Martian terrain and survived one of the most complex, precise landings. The instruments on board Curiosity will be essential to answering some of our questions about the origins of life and the potential for other life forms in our universe. As you can imagine, the challenges with a manned mission to Mars are manifold compared to a robotic mission, the first of which is safety, and the second, funding in the current fiscal environment. But I would caution us because if Dwight Eisenhower or President Kennedy had thought about the funding priorities in getting to the moon, they would have said no, but they didn't. They said yes. And they were okay not to even live to see that accomplished. Our challenge really has to be the same. And if we commit today to reach Mars by 2030, we'll have more than a 15-year funding profile for planning and development to meet the challenges of accomplishing a complex mission. And if you think about that kindergartner today, that means that within that child's lifetime, that child will get to experience what some of us, what I experienced when we did Ma Apollo 
and Gemini and Saturn, a 15-year funding window. The major scientific challenge will be to understand the impact of deep space missions on humans. Not only will astronauts be traveling for long periods of time in compact space, but during long duration space travel, astronauts will experience dangerous solar storms and galactic cosmic rays resulting in high levels of radi radiation. And with our current technology, it would take six months to reach Mars and another six to return to Earth. But that's the point. We're not talking about our current technology. Just the travel to and from Mars might expose humans, would expose humans, to radiation levels that would exceed the maximum allowable career limit for a NASA astronaut. This is why we need new technology investment. Curiosity's radiation detec assessment detector is providing life science experts early information about these radiation levels and allowing scientists to consider the implications for astronauts as well as the sort of suit shielding equipment and life support that's going to be needed to safely transport NASA astronauts to and from Mars. We do want them to return. Now, given the safety priority, NASA also has to develop lighter shielding, develop new propulsion technology that could take astronauts to Mars faster, and a heavy lift system that could support all of the necessities. These are serious challenges. Solar electric propulsion or even nuclear thermal propulsion would be critical to the long-term plan for this mission. NASA and some private companies are already working on propulsion technology aimed at expediting the journey. You see, we've already begun the process. The question is whether we will commit to seeing it through. We would also need to consider how we can evolve the current space launch system in Orion capsule to meet Mars's mission requirements. These are answerable questions, but we must get to the task of actually answering them. The challenge of entry, descent, and landing comes next. For the Curiosity rover, the Mars Science Laboratory devel developed a high-precision system that required six different spacecraft config configurations, 76 pyrotechnic devices, the largest supersonic par parachute ever designed and manufactured, and more than 500,000 lines of code to execute the required maneuvers to safely ease Curiosity to the surface. 500,000 lines of code, that's a lot of jobs in the industry. It's a lot of testing, too. The spacecraft that will carry humans to Mars could be the size of a two-story home weighing 40 tons. The rover weighs a ton and, in terms of size, is only comparable to a small car. We have a lot of work to do. The initial challenges are clear and they're significant, but the potential benefits to include technological advancement potential resource mining, and an improved understanding of our Earth's history and processes makes this mission worth doing and worth doing safely. In order to accomplish this challenging and pioneering endeavor, we have to declare as a nation that a manned mission to Mars is a priority and a program of national significance. We need to determine which milestones along the road to Mars would address the risk and challenges to reach the Martian surface and safely return. Successive NASA authorization acts have authorized a stepping stone approach to human exploration. This is not new to us. Our mission to the moon took incremental steps through the Mercury, Gemini, and early Apollo missions. To land humans on the moon, we need to take a stepping stone approach also to reaching Mars. Milestone destinations include cislunar, the moon, near-Earth asteroids, Lagrangian points, Mars orbit, or Martian moons, among the many steps that can be taken to be considered to help prepare for eventual human exploration of Mars. I want to caution and make very clear that in my view, neither Congress nor the President should assign any of these destinations to NASA in a roadmap to Mars. It's not our job. We have to resist the urge to prescribe NASA's technical requirements and instead allow the competent workforce at NASA and within the scientific, engineering, and academic community from top to bottom to determine the necessary steps. Neither President Eisenhower nor President Kennedy sat down and did the job of scientists and engineers, and we shouldn't be doing that either. Another critical component of the roadmap 
is establishing whether the International Space Station will be available as a testbed beyond 2020. Extending the ISS until at least 2028 will allow us to research further the impact of microgravity on, on the human body. It will provide an analog based in space for simulations and enable technology testing. This also provides an opportunity to engage our international partners early to determine their role in this long-term program. We will need them and we want them, but we also want them to be ready to be with us. We will also need to consider the Mars sample return mission, enabling the collection of sample Mars rocks, soil, and atmosphere for return to Earth and allowing Mars scientists to conduct chemical and physical analysis to understand the Martian environment before sending our astronauts. A long-term plan to reach Mars should also consider robotic precursor missions to test and demonstrate te technologies and assess the hazards or potential risks as part of a roadmap. Defining NASA's long-term vision and developing a clear roadmap is a priority of mine, and I hope to outline this priority through the 2013 NASA Authorization Act, which will be released later today. A clear vision and roadmap will provide a certainty and direction needed to set NASA on the right course and reawaken our position as a nation in the driver's seat of 21st century innovation. Human curiosity the determination to explore and understand the world and universe around us has defined humankind. And we've constructed high-powered telescopes so we can look into the heavens. We've developed rockets powerful enough to launch into space. And we have landed man-made vehicles on another planet. Mankind has shown that we can accomplish nearly anything when we're truly determined. I know that the next time that I lay out on the beach and I look into the stars, and I see Mars, I want to know that it's Americans who've had the capacity to get us there. John F. Kennedy said it best, and perhaps more plainly, that we don't need to choose exploration and innovation because they are easy, but because they are hard. I hope that we can continue to honor that spirit that's brought us so far and will take us even farther than we can imagine. I'm ready, and so should we all be. Thank you very much. And now the hard part, the questions. How do we do this? Um, I'll pick them up okay. you answer them. <laughs> so we have one in the front, yes. Well, this is why I think it's a really great question because we know that uh, politics plays a huge uh, role in all of these discussions, but this is why I'm calling on all of us to develop collectively a unified vision. I think it's actually been very difficult um, both for the agency and for the private sector workforce to figure out who's on first from one pr president to a different vision and direction from uh, one Congress to the next. And so it isn't even just about uh, presidents and administration's determination about what to do next. It's also about what the Congress has done. And what I'm saying to you here today is that it's time for us to stop that and to come up with a unified vision, something that the Congress, the president, and the agency all sign off on so that our industry knows where to go, uh, go next. We've developed this robust industry, and this misdirection puts us on the verge of allowing it to sink right before our eyes. Uh, over there. And could I ask people to do me two favors? Introduce yourself and then wait for the microphone. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Pat Host with Defense Daily. A representative Edwards, you said that Congress should not tell NASA what would be the appropriate steps to take to get to Mars. I'm wondering if there was an effort in your subcommittee to uh, uh, direct NASA to do, uh, you know, whether they should go certain steps or not. And I'm wondering if there was that effort and if you did anything to uh, fend that off or will that be in the authorization report? That's exactly what I'm cautioning against. Um, I think, you know, and especially as somebody who um, who worked in the industry for a time and on a really wonderful project, um, one of the sensibilities that I think I bring to this is knowing that there are really incredibly competent, talented, smart people who are not in the Congress who need to figure this out. And that our goal has to be Uh, sort of like a board of directors, to set a vision, uh, to offer some clarity in that vision, and then to leave it to those who are really talented to figure it out. And so um, while I think that you could hear some of that in um, some of the discussions that have taken place in our committee over these last several weeks and months, again, what I'm saying today is that that has to stop in order for this industry to grow, in order for the agency to evolve, in order for our international partners to understand uh, what's next, and for those in our academic community to also be on that page and of that mind. What is interesting to me, um, and we could hear it especially over these last couple of weeks, is that there is, there's a lot of clarity, frankly, within the scientific Uh, community, but they have to be the ones to spell out the direction and to write that roadmap. We should be the ones to say, we believe in the great vision, and now let's have it fulfilled. My name is Hasmuk Shah from Business Times. Thank you. My name is Hasmuk Shah from Business Times, which has been promoting U.S. business interests in South Asia, especially India. Now, recently there was a U.S.-India strategy dialogue held in New Delhi where Secretary of State, Mr. Kerry, (coughs) visited and there was a big discussion held on many subjects, especially on defense space and other explorations. U.S. administrator, NASA administration also had visited India. So there is a lot of opportunity for promoting U.S. business in space technology with India's partnership. Can you throw some light on that, sir? Because it's going to create a lot of jobs in America through Indian partnership. Thank you. What I would say to that is that um, I recall when I was uh, part of the industry and the international community was really in its infancy. That is really not true uh, today. And so I think that we're going to have an awful lot of strategic partners if we have a unified Uh, vision. And that will allow American corporations both to create jobs here in the United States, but also across across the globe. And whether that is with India, and I think that that is a partnership that will facilitate uh, the, uh, the technological relationships that we need. Uh, but there are many all around the world that would be buoyed by robust leadership on the part of the United States. And when I say that the United States has to lead, it's not the kind of leadership that we experienced in the 1960s when essentially because of the Cold War and other aspects, we were kind of the game in town. Today is a very different challenge. And so when the United States leads, it coordinates the work of our international uh, partners, it galvanizes the work of what is not anymore a young and uh, growing industry, but is very mature and can do lots of things on its on its own. And it galvanizes scientists and researchers who are around uh, around the world. NASA is going to be at the center um, of that, but uh, we will have a lot of other partners. from Aerospace Corporation. Uh, You emphasized the homework that we need to do to to get where we want to go in in the solar system. I think we can certainly all all agree with that. Uh, But, uh, and and that uh, the Congress should not be telling scientists and engineers how to do their job. 
Well, th doesn't that conflict with uh, the idea that Congress is going to say, thou shalt go to Mars and thou shalt do it by 2030? Um, if you take that approach, you risk having uh, something that we don't want, which I refer to as Apollo 2.0. This is a bad thing because what that, what that means is we would, we would maybe have one or two missions that would be uh, elaborate scientific field trips and then no follow-up for two or three generations. Certainly we don't want to get into that, so uh, should we not be uh, moving away from the notion that it's all about destinations and deadlines and instead focus on something like cislunar space development, which will teach us all the things that we need to go out further and uh, at the same time bring the private sector on board as something more than just government contractors? Well, I mean, I haven't, um, I, in fact, I haven't spelled that out, and I think I laid out a wide array of, um, of opportunities that there are for this kind of robust uh, development. But I think it's actually helpful, frankly, uh, for the public for us to have a big goal in mind that people understand that they can look up up to. Um, as much as we need to uh, develop a, a private sector that operates on its own, and there are a lot of players in the private sector now who aren't um, as dependent on government contracts but are thinking intelligently about the future and about technology. Uh, but the fact is that unless the American public writ large embraces this idea, then politicians are not going to have the capacity and the backbone to provide the resources that are necessary for, uh, for development. And I don't know how many of you, uh, but I certainly do. As I go around uh, through, the, uh, through my community and we're in a tough economic time, I hear people all the time say, well, um, if we need to fund schools or roads or bridges or you name the thing, then why are we funding space? Well, for this room and for those who are in the public, I can say that the reason that we make investments in space is for all of those reasons that I outlined, because the payoff is 10 or 100 fold when it comes to the technologies that will be developed, the industry uh, that's, uh, that's created, and the opportunities that there will be for people who aren't just invested in NASA's programs, but for, for companies, for entrepreneurs, uh, for scientists and researchers who are thinking even beyond the box of what the NASA frame will be. That's a vision that I believe the American public can invest in and is prepared to do it, but I think it really does require us being able to say that there is some big goal out there because we embrace ourselves around goals. And I hear your caution um, that we don't just want to be, you know, to send a whole bunch of resources into one place and let that be the end of it. This really does, this effort really does have to spawn a whole new sense of adv adventure and frontier, and I believe that it can do that. Um, hmm. How about the fellow right there, and then we'll get the one in the back. All right, thanks. Yeah, my name's Creighton Jones with 21st Century Science and Technology Magazine. So I really appreciate what you had to say. It is refreshing to hear someone in government with this level of vision. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on one. It's sort of two problems, it seems. There does have to be a re-educating of people in government about what real economic value is, what growth is, that it can't be simply measured in dollars and cents, but things like were we to develop nuclear rocket technology, how would that spin off to change everything in our economy? Also, fusion, what would that do for it? So I just want to know what you think in terms of what more we can do to start to re-educate people about what real economic growth is, that which would, how the space program would get us out of this economic crisis, one. And two, there's a real crisis in education. I mean, you hear from industry, from machine tool factories, that they just don't have the skilled labor force to carry out this kind of a mission and were we to really have a robust space program, obviously we'd need more and more at that level. So secondly, how are we going to address the educational crisis? Um, a couple of really good, um, good points. I think that um, when I think of our STEM learning, science, technology, engineering, and, and math learning, one of the things that occurs to me is that 
Um, when I was in grade school, and some of you remember this as well, that the mere fact of a robust space program inspired people to want to do science and math. And so we did have that generation that was created. And then we had a lapse, and people are no longer as in inspired, not in the, in the same kind of way. And so it's kind of one thing to push money out into STEM fields, but it's another to show young people what that bold vision is, what they can aspire to. And so much about what NASA does and what this industry does is about aspiration. And when those aspirations are there, we will find, we'll find the teachers, the students will come pouring out uh, to learn, but not if they don't know that there's anything on the, on the other side. And so I think that these things work um, work together, and so um, it, it's important for us to make the investments in STEM learning so that we create the kind of workforce that's really needed uh, to see out this vision, but we have to recognize that we have to have a vision in order to create that education stimulus for uh, young people to grow and learn and, um, and develop. And then with respect to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the industry, I think that uh, it is, it's really complicated to get policymakers to see on the other side of something. And so we have to tell the story about um, all of the great innovations that NASA has spawned. I mean, NASA itself, I think, holds about 6,400 uh, patents, and not to mention the patents that are held um, throughout the industry. That's real economic development and growth. And when you tell the story about the airbags or the titanium that's in your braces or um, the, you know, your sunglasses that are more protective than they used to be from ultraviolet uh, violet light. Those are stories that help people understand the value, the true economic value of what this industry produces. Hi, Congresswoman Edwards. I'm Dan Leone with Space News. Thanks for coming to talk to us. I'm afraid my question's not as interesting. I'm curious, in the hearings about uh, the, the subcommittee's NASA authorization proposal, it's been pretty clear that there's some disagreement and some people who are of the opinion that things need to change before it goes to markup. Well, here we are going to markup. What changes, if any, will you propose? You know, in television they say stay tuned. Um, and so this afternoon we'll actually, I'll be releasing um, a proposal that really is about a vision. And I think that there are two minds here. On the one hand, the majority has introduced um, uh, or has, a, has draft leg legislation that um, says here are the constraints under which we are right now. And I think that's one way. I don't think it's the way that you do science, frankly. I think that when you invest in science, you have to, again, think aspirationally. And so I've proposed a vision that recognizes that we have fiscal constraints, but also that plots the work out over a 15-year period that allows the kind of funding profile that really will spur the kind of development at a pace and a timeline that's responsible. I think one of the, the things that um, has occurred to me since I've been on the committee is the constant adding to the laundry list of things that NASA is supposed to do and that the industry is supposed to fulfill without providing anywhere near the level of resources that are required. And so again, uh, you will see an authorization that I will introduce that um, recognizes the multi-mission focus of the agency because I believe that those missions are incredibly important to all of the work and that they are connected to each other that will allow us to do space exploration in a responsible way, but you will also see a funding profile that says, NASA, we believe in you. We believe in what you can do. We believe in what the industry can do, uh, and we're prepared to make an investment in that vision. And it will be bold, and it will be audacious. Uh, I think we have two more questions, and that might have to be it. So we had one over in the corner there, and then one of the, we have four more questions. Do you have a little time, Congresswoman? 
Sure. Oh, thank you. So we have time for four more questions, but that's it. Hi, I'm Peter Johnson, class 2016, Princeton University. Um, my question is, with such a prescriptivist goal as 2030 or bust, how do we protect non-Mars-focused NASA programs from being cut once we reach crunch time? Well, I, th I think, as you have just heard, um, I believe and I want to reaffirm a commitment to the multi-mission focus of the agency. Um, out in my district, um, near in my county, uh, the home of Goddard Space Flight Center. It is the home of an awful lot of work that is, that is not necessarily focused on human exploration. And yet it has great value to understanding the Earth, uh, great value to understanding and seeing the sun and, um, and everything in between. Uh, and I believe in that and want to make an investment in it. And I think that we, as one of the things that sets NASA apart as this nation's space agency is the fact that we've taken on all of the big work to be done. And whether that is in heliophysics or astrophysics and earth science and human exploration and all of the research and uh, technology in between, I think that that is the value of the agency and it is the value of all of the, all of the industries that have grown up around this agency. And it would be irresponsible, irresponsible for us to give up on that multi-mission focus. Hello. Yeah, my name is uh, Herman. I am a freelance for uh, a newspaper in Jakarta, Indonesia, and I am also a member of a National Press Club in Washington. I read the history of a Congressional Science Committee, and I understand also it was abolished a couple of years ago. And my question is that, is there any difference between the present commission, Science Commission at the Congress, with in the past, which was abolished? Thank you. Well, one of the differences is that I'm on the committee now. <laughs> and I, I think that we have actually a number of uh, new members um, on the science committee who really do have a deep understanding and commitment um, to our nation's space program writ large and who understand that while human exploration is a significant component and should be of what we do, uh, that there are many other things that uh, the agency does. I mean, let's just look at what, it, what happens now with weather forecasting and prediction. And those, thing, that, those fields have actually grown up around a robust and developed NASA committed along with, uh, along with NOAA. Um, and so uh, I will just, uh, just share with you that over these next several weeks, we are also going to have a very robust discussion about the future of space exploration and whether we have a commitment as a nation to make the investments that are necessary and required for us to remain at the top. And we can either be content to look backwards, and we can be content to be second, or we can strive for a vision that makes certain that we're first and that we lead. Okay, I think we had one in the back all the way by the wall. Commercial Space uh, Coalition, thank you for being so generous with your time today. I was curious whether you have uh, engaged in any discussions with members of your subcommittee uh, as to uh, renewing or improving our risk sharing regime as a way to drive innovation. Uh, we have, um, and I think that uh, what you will see though reflected in, um, in our authorization is a, you know, a recognition, and I have to say from the, um, on the uh, commercial, uh, commercial side, those of you who've seen me evolve over the past couple of years understand that I was not a believer 
um, at first in the role of, um, of commercial companies in commercializing um, space transportation. And it's an evolution that's in process. And I've actually been quite pleased with the progress that's been made thus far and really look forward to the, to the future. And I think that that uh, risk sharing is something that we're going to have to come to grips with. Um, you know, part of me, though, frankly, says that um, if you have an industry that wants to engage in the, in the commercial sector, then it's actually really important that you do what other risk takers do in the larger economy. Um, and on the other hand, I also do understand that um, that some of those risks are unforeseen in this area that is emerging and um, and developing, and so it's a conversation that we need to continue to have. Thank you. What's that for? <laughs> okay. The last question, the gentleman there on the left in the red tie. Hi, Jeff Faust of Space Review. Uh, with these dueling authorization bills, do we run the risk of NASA policy becoming more partisan than it traditionally has been in the past, and what can we do to avoid that? Well, I don't know if you're talking about the recent past, but I have to tell you, over the last couple of years, in fact, it's been quite, sadly, quite partisan. Um, and I think uh, I've had a chance to discuss already with some of my uh, colleagues on the um, on the other side uh, some of these issues, and uh, I think that this will be a work in progress. What I uh, will conclude by saying is that um, I believe, and I and I think that most Americans really believe in the agency, its workforce, its private sector partners and the academic community. And we have a challenge to make sure that the public can push us in a healthy way to do the right thing for our space program for the next generation. And that doesn't have a D or an R written behind it. It has an S for science. Thank you very much.